Hassan from all the delegates who are here. And I remember telling yesterday that UPU is a strong organization. It has a long history. We have survived two world wars. We have survived the Great Depressions. And I knew that uh, we had the capacity to be able to overcome any challenge. So colleagues, uh, the happy news I would like to convey this uh, evening here is to tell you that the UPU is as strong as it has always been. I was nearly 150 or more countries that were gathered here today. We've worked hard and long during the last couple of days here in Geneva. Certainly the last, last night and this morning. But uh, this has been a problem which has been with us for a very long time. So, after long and very, very tiring uh, negotiations last night and today, this morning, we were able to really get a uh, critical mass of member countries really coming together and making the final decision to come with a, a compromise. Uh, what we call uh, option, we call option victory, we call it the V option. The V option or the victory for the union, the V stands for victory and victory is for who? It's for the union, it's for the membership as well as it's for the citizens of this planet because really there's no other organization that has the capacity, the reach and the extent uh, to be able to, to, to serve humanity like the universal cost of the union. Therefore, today, what I really witnessed is a historical moment, really, where we averted possible exit of one of our member countries, and of course, many other disappointing countries. I can tell you, it was very intense, very, very, uh, can I say, really, there are moments when I really felt that uh, things were really falling apart. But I always kept the faith, and the confidence, and the uh, the knowledge that uh, we've always overcome this challenge. So, we had a very interesting day yesterday where an option called Option B was withdrawn in Washington. And that really would have meant, if it had gone through, then probably half the world would have been supported by that option. So, when it fell yesterday, then we fell back to the option which we call C, which was a convergence option which was prepared by the Brussels Post Union as far back as April uh, this year. However, the version we came with, which is called option V, really takes elements of all the proposals that are on the table. My international secretariat, myself and my team, together with the member countries, really worked very hard to come up with a compromise proposal, which I think at the end of the day, what we have witnessed is that every single member country that took the floor, I think more than program, uh, 60, 70 countries spoke this morning and this afternoon in, in support of the, the, the what we call the victory option that we presented. Therefore, the good news is that uh, we have a strong universal postal union, stronger than ever before, and there's not one single country that's going to walk out of this place. Certainly, like every other uh, convergence or every other what we call negotiated uh, uh, models, we have we may not get everything we want, but certainly it has kept the union together. And uh, for once, I think member countries who leave this place are very satisfied uh, that the union is intact. So that is the news I really just wanted to bring to you. I'm very delighted as the Director General under my watch. I do not want to see this union fall apart. And I was relieved, I was vindicated, and I knew that we had the capacity to be able to bring all our member countries together and all our initiative, our efforts, and many, many months and years of really debate has come to fruition this evening. And I'm therefore very, very happy with those uh, uh, results that we have brought this evening. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Let's have a Q&A session. Okay. Post. I'm Jamie, Associate Press. Sir, uh, I understand there's a compromise, but can you give us the details exactly? It's, this is a brand new option. It was not on the table coming in before today, to my knowledge. 
what actually is being decided here? Will the United States be able to self-declare rates right away like they had been hoping to? Well, there are many, many elements of this thing, really. It's a very technical thing that probably I'm not able to, able to answer all of it at this point in time. However, what this means is that, um, first of all, fundamentally we have changed our, our pricing policies uh, in, the, in the, or rather, setting the rate policies for this organization. From now going forward, uh, all member countries agree that uh, self-declared rates will be acceptable in uh, our model for the session system for each other. Now, the question is, everybody's agreed about that. And that's one of the sticking points that the United States was looking for to achieve. And uh, that was uh, achieved. However, the, it depend, the, the, the issue here was that uh, how fast then do we want to achieve that? So <coughs> we wanted a transition period of about five years through which all countries now will be able to move that uh, final, uh, what we call, uh, self-declared rate. Now, um, of course, the United States wanted to have uh, what we call a, a dual uh, speed process, which means, and uh, the principle which was agreed here is that any country, not necessarily the United States, any country with certain parameters of threshold, 75,000 tons of mail that was so that imports, this, this mail, who has the capacity, uh, has the possibility to be able to uh, really self-declare the, 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 the rates. However, it's not 100% declaration. We have to, uh, we have got uh, frontiers, and 70% of the domestic tariffs, that's what we say. And then there on, we can have uh, uh, year on year, then they can be able to raise the tariff 1%. Hold on, sorry. Okay. The United States came in here saying they wanted to be able to declare self-declare rates immediately. Is that what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that from July, America can be able to declare. July 2020 is when they can declare the self-declare rates. That's when it takes it. So uh, from 1st July, next year, they can do it. But for the rest of the membership, I think it is going to be 1st uh, January 2021. Uh, so, sorry, they backed away from their original position then, right? Sorry, but they're, they're, they're not holding the line that they were on coming in, right? They backed away from what they initially well, demanded. Well, this uh, consultation, this is negotiations, and uh, certainly, uh, I, I think the demand has always been that uh, they want to have uh, uh, first July was, 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 was the date they had expressed themselves. But still, I must say that the um, United States of America wanted a self-declare rate, and not only for them, it was the principle that was required, and they, I think the, the, the principle was a good one. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, you said that uh, you thought at one stage it was all going to fall apart. At what, at what point did that change, and, and how much was U.S. flexibility or compromise part of the final solution? Well, I think uh, I will give credit to United States uh, American delegation to be really had a, a very strong uh, influence in, in, in uh, really the positions that we had here. And we needed them to be very honest because they wanted to put this proposal on the table. However, I must say that uh, I, the credit goes to every single member countries and every, every country that has participated in this initiative. Really, I would give, uh, I'll say that uh, this was uh, not easy because tough negotiations, people had different options, and therefore to bring them together uh, <coughs> to reach a compromise was not an easy task. But uh, I knew, I had the confidence that uh, uh, we, do, uh, we, we are going to pull this together. Of course, the option was not, was that uh, we leave this place disappointed and we are not going to get one single unit. Do you think? Well, well, was there a point at which you, you did see the whole thing was on the point of falling apart? Well, uh, I certainly, uh, well, first of all, I think, let me just give you some context to this. Uh, I called for an extraordinary what is called um, a convergence group uh, under, under my leadership. Uh, to Geneva on Sunday. Sunday and Monday we have been working on these things so that I knew certainly that the option, which is called option B, which was the preferred option for the United States, and the option A, which is preferred uh, option for other countries who are, uh, uh, I mean, that the exporters are made, will not fly. Therefore, the, com the, the, the proposal, or, or rather the com conversation was around option C, which was just a midway between the two uh, different uh, spectrums. So, we worked on that proposal, many variants and many, uh, what we call, uh, uh, amendments, and that is really the moment when it really brought almost like four countries together, key players of the, in this market, and drawn from different regions, and of course different levels of economic development. 
So we we sat in a Huawei hotel for almost uh, two night, two days. We walked way late in the night. But when we we're just this close, we could not agree on uh, certain parameters. And really, that was when everybody said, "No, we can't accept," and they walked away. That was, I would say, my lowest moment, and I just felt a little bit disappointed. But uh, we never gave up. We came back, and the next day, which was um, really um, yesterday, we, we we took the whole entire. Uh, thing again head on, and we when the option B, which was the extreme option, uh, preferred option by United States and many other countries called uh, Canada, Brazil, and many others, when that failed yesterday, then what happened is that we had to fall back to what is called option B, which is convergence. But option C was really a challenging option because it had 12 different uh, amendments to it, and therefore, if we had gone into it, it would have taken us probably another two, three days for putting another time. So what we did really, the work we carried out on on Sunday and Monday is really the option C itself. So we already had covered substantial ground, and therefore what I decided to offer this morning is that instead of going through the entire thing, we have already gained a lot of uh, support for this thing, so we just went to those sticky issues which we could not agree on, and tactically went through this with member countries of different views, and really um, uh, worked out what we call a, a diplomatic uh, uh, consultations, I must say. I'm a diplomat and an ambassador myself. I've been trained for some of these things, so I knew uh, that uh, we had to work with, with all these people. And because member countries really saw the agency and the, the desire to hold the union together, I think uh, 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 wisdom prevailed at the end of the day, and uh, they came together. And that's where. Yeah. Yes, sir. Stefan Bissan, the Tony newspaper. Uh, two questions. First, uh, what remains from the multilateral system with this option of self-declared rates? And second question, what will be the impact on the rates? And will there be a, a sharp increase that will impact e-commerce? What is the impact on the uh, multilateral system? Yeah, of course, GPU is a multilateral organization. And therefore, what we have, we have found is really the desire to maintain that system. It's not a unilateral system. Countries can have difficulties with a particular specific aspect of our business or our relationships, but uh, what happened here is that what was reinforced today is the desire to uphold a, a, a multilateral uh, treaty here has been, has been developed today, to be honest. So, uh, again, uh, I, uh, it really is, is our DNA, the, the multilateralism is part of the community. The second question I missed again, sorry. It's about the impact of the Red Zone, okay, fine. Really, of course, uh, any red uh, revision has impact on customers. It's not about that. But uh, we are there to see how this will really uh, um, uh, affect the volumes. I don't have the statistical figures that have been offered here right now. But certainly, any mail is going to United States of America. Of course, if they reach the threshold of 75,000 tons going to that country, they can self declare, which means that uh, they will not get the full 100% rates, which means they can't, uh, uh, I mean, uh, impose the tariffs, for example. Uh, of 100% domestic tariff in the country. There is a 70% cap, uh, which assumes then that this mail has already been processed and brought from other countries, therefore, it cannot really meet exactly the, 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 the domestic tariff. But then from there on, then they can be able to raise every year on to see whether they can be able to reach 80% cap. We put it at 80% cap. So these are some of uh, the technicalities which you probably see to the technical for you. But the principle behind here is that self declared rate is a feature of our uh, remuneration system. We have time for one more question. Gentleman in front of me. Uh, Laurent Ciro, Swiss News Agency. Uh, does that provision on the 75,000 uh, tons a year introduce a kind of two speed uh, organization that might be used by other members for other uh, discussions in the future? And do you have the, the impression that that system, because it dates back from 1969, will it prevail for the next 50 years? No, I think what has happened is that uh, the system which was there from 1969 will no longer be functional with this one fixing now for next year. So that is already a departure from our, our immigration system for sure. Uh, the 75,000 tons is a threshold we have set up for a country to be able to invoke this self territory rate then that is, you have to have that threshold fast. The second thing is that they have to do it. I mean, it is, it is a, is a, they can either invoke it or not. They don't have to, but if they want to do so, they can do so. But even that, then we have to have them with this, what is called, 
um, uh, you can cap it up to 80% of the uh, up to 80%, which means from 70, which is the baseline, and moves up to 1, 1, 1, 1 uh, percent up to the up to the, up to the percentage of 80 of the domestic tariff. That way, then we know that um, countries cannot just, just pick any number and say this. Jamie, one quick so question, I, I and then we have to follow finish. up on Stefan's question. Okay. Just to follow up on his question, because it's a really important one for my readers. Okay. Will customers, which customers will see rates go up? Will they see higher shipping and delivery costs in their daily lives if they're trying to send or receive mail? Well, what will happen here is that um, once a country declares the uh, rates, the sending administrations or the, the, the exporting countries will have to factor that cost. So it means then that cost will be transferred, transferred, uh, transferred to the person who's, who's sending that, that item. And, not, and certainly those who are, okay, let me put it this way. When you are in a country and you, 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 you buy item overseas, the customer, the end customer will definitely have to get a higher price because it's not the only price which is reasonably important. So I, I have no doubt in my mind that to have um, a financial impact, or, or rather let's say impact on, on, on the customers globally, uh, of the from the exporting countries as well as the Okay, that's the end of the press conference with the Director General. <coughs> um, we have another guest, um, but first of all, sir, I'd like to escort you out. All right, everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, coming here. Just, um, just one year ago when President Donald J. Trump learned that the U.S. postal system was being forced to heavily subsidize the importation of a flood of foreign packages at the expense of American factories and jobs, he said to me in the Oval Office, fix it. Today, a White House-led team working closely with the Director General of the Universal Postal Union and a broad coalition of friends and allies within the UPU has more than achieved the President's goal, and we have done it in Trump time, which is to say, as quickly as possible. At just the third extraordinary Congress in UPU history, member countries today approved by unanimous acclamation to adopt a comprehensive set of reforms based on the U.S. proposal. This measure provides the United States with the ability to immediately self-declare its postal rates and thereby cover it, its costs. This is and was the linchpin of President Trump's objectives. This agreement will also transform an antiquated discriminatory system into a modern and resilient one far more prepared to meet the new demands of e-commerce and the increasing challenges of counterfeit goods and drugs such as fentanyl now being pushed like poison through the international mail system. Today's victory was neither easy nor preordained. In fact, the skeptics, and there were many, said it couldn't be done. However, instead of leaving the UPU, as the United States was more than prepared to do, we will leave Geneva having demonstrated a new brand of Trumpian diplomacy. This diplomacy is based on one simple principle. International organizations like the UPU must respect the rights of the United States and serve their members rather than be used as piggy banks by bad actor countries that seek to bend their rules. 
Today's outcome is also a huge victory for millions of American workers and businesses that President Trump tirelessly champions every single day. It is both appropriate and not without irony that we achieve this historic victory just a few blocks away from the World Trade Organization and during the week of the United Nations General Assembly meetings. An important signal has been sent. With this new agreement, the United States will remain a member of the UPU. This favorable outcome could not have taken place without two irresistible forces. President Trump's resolute willingness to take on a flawed international system and the strong leadership of U.S. Postmaster General Megan Brennan, Deputy U.S. Trade Representative Dennis Shea, the Department of State's superb Chief UPU Negotiator Stephen Anderson, and Special Assistant to the President Hunter Morgan. And I want to have you think a little bit about what has happened here. This is a problem that goes back to Ronald Reagan in the 1980s and before that. President Reagan himself expressed deep concern for the market distortions of the UPU. The problem, of course, is that neither Reagan or any president that followed him ever did anything about it. President Trump did this in 11 months. 11 months. That is Trump time. And this could not have been done, really, without working closely with our friends and allies and with the UPU negotiator. Now, um, what we will do as a practical matter is we will begin our self-declared rates um, in the end of June of next year. This is exactly what we wanted and had planned for. Uh, it won't take place tomorrow because it, it takes time to get to that point, but immediate self-declared means we do it as quickly as possible on our end. Postmaster General Megan Brennan has, has prepared for that, and we will do that. Now, in terms of the rest of the proposal, uh, with this uh, synthesis proposal, we were able to help our friends and allies get to self-declared rates as well over a, a slightly longer period of time, so that's important. This is the essence of the multi-speed option. So this was a, a key uh, portion um, of, of this. We have an escalator clause in uh, the uh, mechanism so that uh, under the uh, cost to tariff ratio, if it exceeds 70%, which, which we do not assume it will, but if it is, there's allowed some adjustment just like any contract in any kind of business or government situation would allow for. So that's a, a good thing. Um, we have a really nice provision to assist the um, UPU to um, get to a complete uh, electronic data system, which is critical to monitoring the, the counterfeit and illicit drugs. Um, so uh, let me stop there and take some questions, uh, and uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, I, I noticed that the, I, I think that the Financial Times is not here. Uh, but I would like to uh, congratulate the Financial Times for being an important part of this story because um, they, they reported it well, and I had several op-eds in their paper. Uh, first one, we began this fight a year ago, and then uh, just recently coming into this. So, uh, yes, sir, and please uh, just identify yourself and all that. Laurent Ciro, Swiss News Agency. You mentioned WTO, you mentioned the Trumpian time. Does that mean that the next stage for WTO might be a more precise schedule uh, before a potential uh, withdrawal from the organization? I just say I'm Dennis Shea. Uh, the United States has a number of issues with the WTO. We have a differentiation proposal that we're pushing. We've raised many concerns about the appellate body. So reforming the WTO is a big part of our agenda. The, uh, I said in my prepared remarks that an important signal has been sent. It's, it's, it's multiple signals in a way. It basically shows that uh, you can achieve a result with an international organization that actually serves its members rather than 
then, uh, then punishes some at the expense of others. Uh, it also points the way to the ability uh, to, to come to that kind of result. Yes, sir. Let's try, do me a favor. Let's try to keep our questions related to Universal Postal Union. I'm, no more WTO questions. Yeah. Paul Needham, CP Research, I'm a trade We're, journalist reporter. Paul Needham, CP Research, I write on the postal industry for like I see. Okay. 15 to 20 years. Yeah. Uh, two questions only. So how do we do? How, how, long, how long has this issue been going on? Longer than I've Longer been. Than than we did it in what? Less than a year? So, so much, you'll, you'll write a good story then, right? How much are Chinese small packets to the U.S. going to be going up, for, going up by from next July is the obvious first question. So what is the price increase going to be, particularly for the Chinese small so, packets? So we don't, uh, yeah, that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let our... Second question? Yeah. Okay, second sure. question is also, um, under the terms of this agreement, the USA is going to be paying 40 million U.S. dollars over the next five years to the UPU, is what I was reading. Have you actually bought this agreement, this victory? Oh, well, that's funny. Okay, so let's let's do that math. Okay, uh, first of all, the money uh, we, there's an agreement where 40 million dollars over a five-year period uh, will be as the um, um, uh, used by the UPU. So, do me a favor. How much is that a year? Quick. How much is it? Eight. Eight. Okay. So, how much do we save? A year by this agreement? You tell me. Did anybody read my op eds or anything like that? Anybody? Hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. Good. He gets it, right? Uh, it, anywhere from $300 million to $500 million in savings and subsidies uh, over here, and then $8 million over here a year, which will be used in a large part for what? Were, were we listed? Were, were, what did I say we were going to use that money for earlier? Security. Security. Thank you. All right. So did we buy the agreement? I think not. Thank you. Uh, now, your first question, I, I can't give you the details on that. But um, here's what I can tell you. And it, it, this, is, this is partly a, a U.S. story, but it's also a story of other countries. And we've seen studies that show uh, the size of the subsidy um, to... Um, the Chinese is uh, very significant depending on how much it weighs. I mean, it, it can be as much as uh, ten dollars per per packet if it's a, it's if it's more uh, more towards the two point two kilogram side and less. So um, there's no question that their rates are going to go up uh, as they should. And uh, the the problem we had a lot of countries. It's not just the China problem, but it's primarily a China problem. We need to be honest about that. And it, Iceland, it, during the, um, uh, it's heartbreaking, Iceland, the Iceland representative, if you were there, said what? Didn't anybody? They said they went bankrupt because of this, right? There's just so many packages coming in from China and elsewhere under this permal due system. So, uh, yeah, rates are going up. Yeah, we'll buy, we'll buy less Chinese stuff and we'll, we'll buy more stuff from other countries and we'll make more stuff in America and the market will be free of distortions. And that's, that's we call that a hat trick in hockey. What else we got? Yes, sir. Sir, hi, I'm Jamie from Associated Press. Um, I'd like to go back. You mentioned that businesses and workers are going to benefit. Yes, sir. What about consumers in America? What You mentioned that if the prices sure. from China are going to go up, but are people going to be paying higher um, costs for shipping and delivery when they make an order? No, there's, there's nothing for shipping internationally. There's no change in the shipping rates. In fact, the post office will be, be, be better prof, uh, uh, profitable from a profitable standpoint, uh, so they, they, there will be no upward pressure on their rates. And remember, when you run a 300 to $500 million loss a year on subsidies, you, you, you got to find that money elsewhere. So this will actually help uh, keep rates down. But more importantly, more importantly, it will allow um, our domestic manufacturers, specifically small e-tailers and, and, and cottage industry types, uh, they won't have to have their product stolen and counterfeited in China and then sent and sold to a destination off of, off of Alibaba. Um, at a price less than what they can produce it. I mean, that's just crazy stuff. So this is all good for America. Consumers, workers, entrepreneurs, business is big, business is small. 
Can I just follow up? I mean, sure. my understanding was you were coming in here hoping to have the self-declared rates take No, right that's away. absolutely false. Okay. That's absolutely false. Never, never. Uh, we, we had a clear understanding that we would start them in July of next year based on information from the first the Postal Regulatory Commission and then uh, the Postmaster General who we work with beautifully on this. Okay, it just, it takes time. Okay, we're, we're, you can't just you can't just like put the pill in the in the water and, and, and you know, have it become wine. Right? right, it takes a while. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. It was also my understanding that at some point or another these self-declared rates were going to come into effect anyway. So I mean, we're essentially no, that's not that's not accurate. That's not accurate. It wasn't. It that's wasn't not accurate. In 2021 already. That's not accurate. If if we did nothing, um, we would never get the world to self declare declared rates, we would never ourselves get to self-declared rates, we would have some bump ups, but no, that's just, that's just false. No, th this is, this is a big deal, okay, it's a big deal uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is the U.S. got immediate self-declared rates, that saves us a half a billion dollars, it eliminates market distortions, it creates tens of thousands of jobs for America, it, it also helps our friends and allies in other nations, uh, Norway, Finland, uh, Brazil, uh, who are getting hammered by the situation, allows them in a multi-speed option to get to that path. So, so if you write a bad story about this, you got your facts wrong. What else you got? Yes, sir. Uh, we just heard from the uh, from Mr. Hussein that there was a point where these talks nearly fell apart and people basically went, left the meetings that you were having on Monday and it looked as if the whole deal was coming unstuck. What, what, was, what did you walk away from at that point and what was fixed that brought you back together again? And secondly, you talked about the electronic system, that, uh, the electronic screening system. What, what's the, the plan for introducing that and how, exactly how... So, so hold that for a minute. Let's just, let's just do the first one. Yeah. Let's talk about process. So... Uh, we were on public record in the Financial Times as saying that there were uh, two acceptable options to the United States. One was option B, which was the most disruptive. Uh, it would provide self-declared rates uh, immediately to everybody. And then the second most disruptive option, uh, and I use that word in a constructive way, um, is, is the option C with the American Amendment. Okay, which is the multi-speed option, right? And then there were the gradations of that all the way down to to the bad faith option A, which which would have done nothing, right? So by the rules of the UPO Extraordinary Congress role, you must consider each proposal uh, ranked by most disruptive to least disruptive. So in the op-ed I wrote in the Financial Times, I said there's two separate options: option B and the multi-speed. Right? So we knew, um, first of all, that we would deal with option B, right? And that would be first, and that was on Tuesday, right? Um, we knew that that was a tougher challenge in order to get the votes because um, it had just by, by count fewer supporters and more, more opposition. So, so that's fine. So we... That, the, the good part was that we, we took care of that on Tuesday. We let option B folks have their say. We fully supported that. But we knew that the next day we would have uh, option C considered. Now, here's what's interesting. This is why I have to salute my friends from the UPU. They did a fantastic job. What, what uh, Bashir did... Uh, was convene um, a group of, I think, about 30-something countries on Sunday and Monday of this week, including uh, my good friend here, Ambassador Shea, who was in every single meeting, every single minute. And uh, the beauty of that, pro the, the goal of that process was, get to, was to get to what we got to today. But we didn't get to that. Okay? We almost got to that. But, but what the process was able to do through um, Bashir's leadership uh, and the participation of folks like Ambassador Shea was to identify what we disagreed on and what the boundaries of that were, right? 
And, and that was the beauty of that process. And so once you knew um, what you agreed on, what you disagreed on, and what the range of disagreement was, then you could be within the box of consensus. And so through the efforts um, of uh, the UPU leadership working with many of the countries that had to come into that majority coalition, uh, they arrived at the result today. And if you noticed what happened today, this, this um, session was supposed to start at 9 a.m., right? But no, 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 no. They wanted more time to, to work to this. There were technical issues with writing the actual documents, which they did beautifully. There were the politics of talking to the competing parties and, and, and bringing them on board. And I think, I think that, um, that the realization is that uh, in a large organization such as this or in a large organization such as my Congress, it's very difficult to do a trade uh, agreement, which is effectively what this is, uh, by uh, many, many amendments. You're better off if you can. We have in our, our Congress what's called fast-track legislation. It's like comes, you vote it up or down. We want our Congress, by the way, to do that with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement tomorrow, but, or at least within 30 days. But in this case, the brilliance of, of uh, the leadership here was, okay, uh, here we are. We're in the box. This is what we think the market can bear. From a technical and political standpoint, they worked it. So by the time 3 o'clock rolled around the room, um, they had disseminated the appropriate information and gotten buy-in from people. And I stress, look, this was not preordained. This was hard work. These, these gentlemen and our people uh, and many other people were up till 3 in the morning last night and, and up at 7 this morning, and they did it. So I think it's useful to understand how that worked. I mean, this, was, this is a beautiful thing. This is, this is how processes should work when they when they work well and they we were sufficiently close and uh, the fact that the US was going to leave the UPU um, I think played us uh, President Trump was was in the room and China was part of that 34 pardon me China was among the 34 countries I don't know was China part of 34 yeah China was part of the 34 yeah. I wasn't part of the but my He's, 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 the, he's the professional in these matters, Dennis Shea. Okay. If you're in Geneva, if you want to know something about the WTO or trade, he's the guy. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. John Zarakostas with Penske Media in the U.S. I'd like to ask you, sir, to clarify for our readers who are businessmen, what does this deal mean if I'm a producer in San Francisco exporting to New York, oh, uh, uh, shipping through the post to New York compared to someone who's shipping from Shanghai to New York. What well, you're not going to ship race cars, right? No, no, no. no we're talking small small, packages. small small packages. What's the difference, um, and how does that give a leg up to the domestic manufacturer or service provider? And I've got to follow up. Okay, so so the big leg up to American workers and manufacturers um, is protection from subsidized inbound. Okay, and you can go go and look at the press coverage. There's like the mighty mug example, but but you can the, the problem we have is that um, products uh, if you, if you try to ship from say Chicago to New York a product that you made in Chicago, your postal rates are far higher than the postal rates from China. And given that it's small parcels and low margins and all of that, there's a lot of cases where you simply can't compete. And if you want to do the analytics from an economics point of view, um, what happens is low margin manufacturers in America get pushed out of the market and high margin manufacturers get their margins squeezed. And our unemployment goes down, our tax revenues go down, our economic growth rate goes down. Right, so that's that's 
the primary issue issue there. Um, you know, if you're if you're exporting in a in a world, um, we don't anticipate significant issues um, issues there. Um, but but let's keep in mind too. It's like I, I, I encounter this problem all the time when we're talking about tariffs and trade and things like that. It's like, won't the consumer pay more? Well, um, the, the bigger problem here, besides this, the heavy subsidies of the Postal Service, is, is these broader, longer-term economic impacts. I mean, whether it's Iceland or Norway or Finland um, or other countries, um, it's, it's a very corrosive um, trade model that China practices. It's, 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 it's designed, it's predatory. And there's a lot of predatory things China does. Uh, this is just one of them, but uh, it's, it's an important one. What else you got? Yeah. Um, uh, how much time we got? Uh, I had a follow-up. Okay. I had a follow-up. You, you mentioned... Let, let me do this. Let's see if anybody else in the room here. So we spread the, spread the love here. Anybody else? Okay. Reporters with no questions. I'm amazed. Yes, sir. I just wonder, sorry, Ben Simon, I work for the AFP News Agency. Do you feel like the United States had to give in at all during this negotiation? Because listening to you talk, it's like a total victory. And, and there was no area where... It's a total victory for the UPU and, and the U.S. I mean, it's... Um, I, think, I think there won't be many times you'll see a result like this. Uh, because uh, I can't think of anywhere... If look, the, the one thing I regret about this is that the other countries weren't able to self-declare, right? But that's that's not our loss. That's that's the loss of of the broader system, okay? But in terms of the U.S., we got immediate self-declared rates. Um, we, we got basically what what we were pursuing and. We, we're going to work with the UPU going forward on a lot of other good reforms. We built really good will with our friends and allies um, in the group. We demonstrated that uh, reform within an international organization can take place uh, in a collegial way once people understand that, that the United States must be respected and that it, that these kind of unfair things that happen, whether it's in the WTO or whether it's in the UPU or the United Nations, wherever it is, it's like, no, no, no. And, and, and that's good for everybody else, right? So, no, I, I, think, I think I don't see anybody losing here. I mean, China's certainly going to pay more for, for um, the privilege of shipping to our market, but that's, that's a good thing for, for the market. It's a good thing for the UPU. Uh, what else? Sir, uh, hang on. Anybody else before we? Yes, sir. It's like you just said you got immediate self-declared rates, but dude, uh, I, I heard you. I heard no, you like talking about. Yeah, hang on. Just, well, just stop. Just stop. Immediate. Just stop. Okay. I I just, just, just stop. It's just like you. you be, be, look, I, I told you that immediate self-declared rates mean and has always meant to us that we're going to start them at the end of June of next year because that's the quickest time we can do them. Okay? I mean, what part of that don't you understand? Okay? You going to want to ask it once more? Okay? Come on, dude. It's like there's other interesting questions to ask here. No, no, there's other interesting questions to ask. Uh, okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, uh, this will be the last one unless sure. somebody sticks up their hand. Sure. I was okay. interested in your <laughs> signals diplomacy that you highlighted in your introduction. Yes, sir. To what extent has it got that in this very room on December 15, 1993, they gaveled the Uruguay around agreements which didn't capture all these issues that you're mentioning in, in the following negotiations on gas? What has this got to do with anything today? The symbolism. <laughs> ah, the symbolism. Yeah. They gaveled it here in this so, very room. You know, here's what, this is an interesting question because the, the, here's the thing, it's like, what the difference between President Trump and, and the previous people who have followed him is he actually understands that uh, when you have unfair and non-reciprocal trade rules, that hurts America. And if you don't bring that mindset to forums like the WTO, you tend to get bad rules. Here's the, here's the last thing I'll leave you. And, and it's like, I, so I'm here for the UPU, but I'm burdened by doing all this other stuff, right? So under the rules 
of the World Trade Organization, which is just a few blocks from here, other, all other countries around the world can charge America systematically higher tariffs than we charge them for the same or similar products. Let me say that one more time. Under the most favored nation clause of the World Trade Organization, it's perfectly legal under WTO rules for other countries to charge us higher tariffs on the same or similar products than we charge them. How often does that happen? About 66% of the time compared to 20% of the time. And for countries like India, China, they charge us higher tariffs 85 to 90% of the time, right? Now that's insane. And so how does that happen? It happens because the presidents who have preceded President Trump have not had the awareness that trade matters in terms of economic growth, jobs, wages, and other things. So anyway, uh, I love that you're covering this story. I think it's a big story, uh, both on its face and uh, for the larger implications uh, of a better future for UPU and reforming international organizations. And I thank you for your time and patience. And I like Geneva. Thank you very much for uh, coming. We sent out a press uh, statement on this too. You can pick it up on our website when we distribute it. Son, from all the delegates who are here. And I remember telling you yesterday that UPU is a strong organization. It has a long history. We have survived two world wars. We have survived the Great Depressions. And I knew that uh, we have the capacity to be able to overcome any challenge. So colleagues, uh, the happy news I would like to convey this uh, evening here is to tell you that the UPU is as strong